the second event in our month-long cyber uh, security celebration, cyber security awareness celebration. Uh, the purpose of today's breakfast uh, is to recognize the efforts our students have made in the Cyber Battle Lab and also thank, thank and recognize our generous benefactors and also thanks, uh, thank all of our, our corporate uh, partners and, and friends that are here. Um, after uh, today's breakfast, the students have prepared a short uh, demo upstairs in the lab for you. I'd like to now introduce our uh, president, Dr. Michael Wood. Thank you, Jason. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. I, I was told that this would have been a delightful day to stay in bed, so thank you all for coming and joining us this morning uh, to help us celebrate our, our country's Cybersecurity Awareness Month. In his proclamation, President Obama said, and I quote, Americans, along with people around the world, depend on the internet and digital tools for all aspects of our lives, from mobile devices to online commerce and social networking. This fundamental reliance is why our digital infrastructure is a strategic national asset and why its security is our shared responsibility. This month, we recognize the role we all play in ensuring our information and communications. Infrastructure is interoperable, secure, reliable, and open to all. So as Capital College, we are delighted to help the President and the country and our illustrious guests celebrate Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Capital College has been at the forefront of cybersecurity education for the past decade. We were one of the first 10 institutions in the country to be designated as a Center of Academic Excellence and in Information Assurance Education by the National Security Agency and the Department of Homeland Security. We have re-upped that designation a number of times. We have to do so every three years. It's not granted in perpetuity. And each time we have done so, we have advanced, advanced our status and raised the bar so that we are one of a literal handful of schools across the country whose curriculum is mapped to the CNSS standards at the most advanced level possible. In our development of educational and training programs for cyber education, We've expanded from our initial master's degree in what was network security and is now called information assurance to educate younger people with bachelor's degrees to get started in information assurance. And just this past year, we expanded upward and launched our first doctor of science program in information assurance. I'm proud to say that we now have 69 doctoral candidates in that program, including 26 new students this fall. We have also, with the help of many of you, developed the Cyber Battle Lab, which you are about to see this morning in action. Uh, that Cyber Battle Lab positions us and our faculty and our students to not only learn but to share information, uh, best practices, uh, work on scenarios for a defense of various kinds of attacks, and share information with our other brother and sister Centers for Academic Excellence around the state and around the country. Through the gracious support of the Maryland Higher Education Commission, we have received two grants to build and support the Cyber Battle Lab. Uh, corporate sponsors like Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman has come to the, have come to the fore to help support us financially and to provide expertise. Uh, recently, Mr. Land and his colleagues from Lockheed Martin gave us a very nice white paper on various cyber battle scenarios with which we are developing curricula to help educate people to deal with those critical issues. We have also uh, worked on building the cyber platform as a centerpiece for our Innovation and Leadership Institute to bring the sciences and the businesses and social phenomena together in a complete educational program for our students. Jason mentioned some of the events going on this month. I encourage you to uh, check out specific dates and the speakers. We have a President's Forum for the ILI coming up later this month. Uh, we have a uh, cyber gamut hack and counter attack hack event also on the calendar for the next week. And on October 22nd, a week from Saturday, our cyber battle team of students is going to be at the Baltimore Convention Center competing as a finalist in Maryland C3, which I believe stands for Maryland Cyber Competition Third Round. Uh, for those of you who travel here from Baltimore, there's a billboard on the north side of Interstate 95 advertising the event. So this is a big deal. It's a great accomplishment for our students and it sets them apart as exemplars in cyber education and uh, development. So I encourage you to attend that as well. 
We have guests here from some of our sister institutions in the state, UMUC and I think uh, Prince George's Community College and a few others. Through one of the grants that we have been successful in achieving from the state of Maryland, uh, we are able to work with our sister institutions in the Cyber Battle Lab and in curriculum development to share best practices and help the governor's office position us as Cyber Maryland so that through the leadership of Dr. McConaughey, whom I will introduce in a moment, we are now able, with uh, the good uh, collaborative graces of our colleagues around the state and the financial support of MHEC, to do more work to position Maryland as a leader in the cyber education world. We are also a military friendly school, as many of you know, so in cybersecurity and other areas of education for our veterans and our military active duty men and women, uh, we stand out as trying to provide the very best for them at the most affordable prices. So again, I thank you so much for coming. Uh, I see several distinguished guests in the audience. I would be remiss if I tried to introduce everybody, so excuse me for not doing so. I do want to acknowledge one of our very newest trustees on the Capitol College Board of Trustees, Mr. Michael Plass from Motorola. Michael, thank you for joining us this morning. Excuse my range of vision. Asuntha, are you here? Okay, we're going to move forward, then I would like to introduce Dr. McConaughey, who will introduce one of our guest speakers for this morning. As most of you know, Vic is the, uh, the lead intellectual driver of our information assurance uh, efforts. He is a uh, young, early retiree from the agency, as it is lovingly called, and has gracefully joined us as our chief academic officer to not only build our cyber education, but to help build the academic program throughout Capital College. Vic, thank you for doing so, and good morning. My colleagues from the agency would debate the word young with you, Mr. President, would that be all right? Thank you all so much for coming. It's a, it's a grand event, and, and as you'll see, it, it's focused on our students, because they're, they're really the, the benefactors of it. When we began to put this together, I, I thought, who, who could I ask? Who, who could come here? Who could say some words, you know? You know, who's been down this road with me? And uh, one, one word, one name just came right to mind. His name is Rich Marshall and closure or BRAC. She serves as a deputy chief of staff for Lieutenant Governor Anthony Brown, who chairs the sub-cabinet. Ms. Chang Smith is charged with overseeing the governor's sub-cabinet on BRAC, which is comprised of heads of Maryland's departments and agencies that are most involved in the state's BRAC-related transition activities. She helps to coordinate and oversee the implementation of all state action to support, the, support excuse me, the military installations affected by BRAC. Asuntha has been a friend and supporter of Capitol College and many of our higher education institutions in bringing cyber education to the forefront in helping the governor to position us as Cyber Maryland. And Asuntha has a, a comment for us and I welcome you to the podium. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Now, I really want to hear the keynote speaker, so I'm not going to say a whole lot, but I will bring this wonderful proclamation from the governor to commemorate today. Um, I first, though, did want to mention that we do have a number of uh, congressional members, representatives here as well. I, I know some folks personally from Senator Mikulski's office, Senator Cardin's office, other folks here other congressional offices. I mean, I think that it's testament to the wonderful work going on here at Capitol College that we do have our congressional members involved, engaged in what we're doing in building that workforce pipeline for cybersecurity, cyber command, and a lot of the uh, BRAC missions that have moved to Maryland. Um, so I have a proclamation here from the governor uh, to proclaim uh, Capitol College Cyber Battle Lab Day. And usually when I read these, it sounds like I'm reading a whole bunch of legalese. So I like to get a little bit of audience participation. So when I say whereas, I want everybody to say whereas. So let, let's try this. I'll go like this and you guys say whereas, all right? It'll, it'll make it a little more fun. So, <laughs> all right, let's try it. Let's do practice. Ready? Whereas. Okay, we're going to have to get a little more lively about this. Okay. So I'm going to start and we're going to get a little more lively here, all right? Capital College Cyber Battle Lab Day, October 13th, 2011. Yes. Oh, that was better. The state of Maryland is honored to play an increased role and responsibility in support of our nation's defense and security efforts and protecting our homeland through the U.S. Department of Defense base realignment and closure process and cyber command. And? Yes. 
The BRAC process will bring 60,000 new jobs and 28,000 families and new neighbors to our great state of Maryland. Capital College will assist in furthering the mission by opening the Capital College Cyber Battle Lab in Laurel, Maryland. And Whereas. Oh, we're starting to fade here. Capital College will highlight how our current and future cyber war fighters are being supported by the new lab providing hands-on experiences to increase the cybersecurity knowledge of undergraduate and graduate students enrolled in cybersecurity information assurance and related programs, middle and high school students, community college students, and area professionals working in the field and, okay guys, this last one, so let's do this good. Whereas. Whereas Capital College Cyber Battle Lab will provide intensive hands-on experience to increase the knowledge of students enrolled in the college's Bachelor of Science programs in Information Assurance, IA, Telecommunications, Engineering Technology, Software Engineering and Computer Science, offer a realistic learning environment for current and potential members of the Fort Meade workforce who enroll in specialized IA training programs and certification preparation classes and serve as a cybersecurity demonstration and career awareness outreach program to encourage middle school, high school, and community college students to consider college studies and careers in IA and other sciences, technology, engineering, and math STEM fields. Now, therefore, I, Martin O'Malley, Governor of the State of Maryland, do hereby proclaim October 13th, 2011 as Capital College Cyber Battle Lab Day in Laurel, Maryland, and do commit this observance to all our citizens, given under my hand in the great seal of the State of Maryland this 12th, of, uh, 12th day of October, 2011, Governor Martin O'Malley. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Asim. I really appreciate it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. All right. Uh, look, Kyle, did you want that? <laughs> Thank you. So, Great. Congratulations. Thank you once again, and uh, next I'd like to introduce our, our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Richard Marshall. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Keith Rhodes. This is this is what's called flipping the next page in the uh, in the in the script here. Actually, I'm getting ready to reintroduce myself and tell you all breakfast is ready in the conference room. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Um, I, again, I'd like to introduce today's keynote speaker, Dr. Keith Rhodes, the Chief Technology Officer at Kinetic. North America Services and Solutions. Mr. Rhodes is a technologist with over 25 years uh, experience both inside and outside of government. He specializes in complete solution sets that combine operations, systems, people and processes into assured mission performance. Before joining Kinetic North America, he served as the U.S. Government Accountability's, um, Accountability Office's first chief technologist, uh, reporting directly to the U.S. Comptroller General. At GAO, he was instrumental in shaping national policy on IT security. Uh, Mr. Rhodes also holds degrees in uh, computer engineering and engineering physics from the Ohio State University and the University of California, Los Angeles, uh, respectively. And throughout his career, he has gamered numerous awards and citations, including a Distinguished Service Award and the first Arthur Fleming Medal for Applied Science. So I'll give a warm welcome to a Mr. Rhodes, or Dr. Rhodes. Thank you all very much. Um, Dr. Wood, distinguished guests, faculty, uh, and especially the students, because um, you're the ones who are embarking on the great adventure, right? Uh, thank you very much for asking me here to what I consider to be a monumental unveiling. Um, this is very important. Uh, having a battle lab, having the practicum is very important. I thought I would entitle my talk today, Age and Treachery, um, as in the adage, age and treachery will overcome youth and exuberance every time. Um, I, I have lived this. Um, one of the points I would make about age and treachery is you gain it over time and you gain it through experience. Um, you're going, you have the youth, you have the enthusiasm. Uh, I don't say age and treachery um, to deride your technical prowess. Your technical prowess either is now or certainly will be after your training non-parial. I mean, there's a reason why 
uh, cybersecurity professionals have an unemployment rate of zero, and you're going to be as good as anybody, if not better. I say this to illustrate the value of the laboratory that is above and beyond superior technical training. The real value of the lab is that it allows you, the student, to learn in a controlled environment the nature of a real cyber-based threat. While textbook knowledge is always needed, the practical application of that knowledge requires a laboratory where experiments can be run and observed such that you can learn the limitations of your tools and techniques and learn how to be your opponent. It's one thing for you to be you, but you're going against an enemy. And it's a real enemy. And it's a constant enemy. We talk about an advanced persistent threat. Well, it's really an adaptive patient threat. And you have to learn how to adapt, and you have to learn how to be very patient. And you have to do that without the fear of having your experiment run awry and become some Frankenstein that goes wandering off to destroy some local village. And as someone, when I was working at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, I stayed up for three days fighting a thing called the Morris worm. Um, you know, Frankenstein's not subtle. So being able to do it in a controlled environment is wonderful. While most people consider technology to be the only part of any cyber-based threat, a laboratory like this one at Capital College can show you that understanding your opponents is as important as understanding your technologies. Realizing the human nature of cyber-based threat can only come from actually engaging an opponent in order to learn biases, tendencies, precursors, and camouflage. Let me give you a purely hypothetical illustration. Uh, let us assume you have an opponent. Let us assume that opponent is actually very talented. Let us assume that opponent, that opponent is equal to you. Right? One thing you have to understand is that opponent is a human being. That opponent has weaknesses. Now, your opponent's good. Your opponent is persistent. Your opponent is patient, your opponent is adaptive, and your opponent begins to gain confidence. Confidence leads to overconfidence because we all have, based on our catechism, the sin of pride, right? Your opponent has the sin of pride. Take advantage of it, but you have to learn how to recognize it. So one day you come into your laboratory and suddenly you see that your opponent has posted his exploits to his Facebook page. Now you look, you say, hmm, that's very interesting. So now you see a picture of your opponent, big smile on his face. You see a picture of his statuesque, state-sponsored girlfriend standing next to him. And you say, hmm, interesting. You see a photograph of his kitchen. In his kitchen, you see his very nice appliances. You see a wonderful copper pan leaning against a counter, drying. And you see the reflection through the window of the center of the city where he lives. You're still a cyber student. But now you're becoming a cyber analyst. You're looking at the evidence. You're seeing the picture. You're figuring out who your opponent is. Most importantly, you're figuring out this Yahoo has something to lose. Now you begin to understand motivation, you begin to understand weaknesses, you begin to understand tendencies, you begin to understand what is driving your opponent. It's not the ones and zeros alone. It's what is the motivation of the opponent and how can you turn that opponent to your advantage. Now, say, so why are you yammering about this? I say, well, you're going to do battle against each other in a nice, safe environment. And you are going to do battle against each other because it's really fun to do battle against each other. And you're going to get really good at it. The one thing I want you to focus on when you're in the laboratory is, yes, it's the ones and zeros. It's the textbook. It's 
how do I do a dead bug attack against firewall and make certain it resets itself, turns itself over, and all of a sudden all the, all the functions are turned on and all the demons go up? Fine. I want you to do that. What I want you also to focus on is what makes my opponent tick? Why is my opponent there? Figure out your classmates. What do they do? What do they think? Why do they do this? Where are they headed? What do they want to do? What would they normally do? Do they normally have this pattern? That's what's important. Okay, the point that I want to leave with you today is it's not just the bits and bytes. It's not the interrupts from the keyboard. It's the digits that make the digits move. Right? That's what's important. So now you have the whole approach to defense. And now you move from being an extremely fine technician doing a purely technical task to being true cyber analysts. And that's what we need. It's not just, can I keep the firewall up and running? Yes, you can. That's a given. You're going to be fine at that. Can I understand why someone's going against my firewall? Now you're the cut above. Now you are the real defense. So I just wanted to make those points to say, think about the lab in a broader view. It's a social environment. I know I was joking earlier about Twitter and saying that uh, I don't have many ideas that I find interesting to myself, let alone that I would want to broadcast from the Starbucks to everybody in town, or certainly in the world. Um, but that's the environment you're in. And being able to see it, map it, understand the tendencies, understand the precursors so that you know what an attack is before an attack comes so that you can prepare, that's the, the distinguishing point. So yes, use the lab, play, blast away at each other, but also remember there are digits at the keyboard and they happen to be these digits, not just the ones and zeros. So again, thank you all for the kind invitation. And I wish you all long, healthy, happy careers protecting me into my old age. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Dr. Rhodes, uh, again, for, for being our keynote speaker today. I think I saw some students rushing to the printer to, to get their resume. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Next, uh, it's my pleasure to invite members of our student-led Cyber Battle Lab team uh, to the podium. Uh, please welcome Jeremy Hedges, Mark Fruckbaum, and Austin Merson. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jeremy Hedges, and I've been here at Capitol for two years and currently pursuing a degree in information assurance. Been in Maryland pretty much all of my life, and I Heard of Capital College through a recommendation through my high school, and almost immediately upon actually coming to Capital College, I was given the opportunity to go to the lab, actually get a feel for the actual room. At the current time, it was just a couple sun, uh, a couple sun terminal uh, desktops that were sitting on the desk. There weren't, there weren't really desktops to, to play with or really anything that we could do to implement for cybersecurity. So thanks to Professor Andrew Mary, we were actually able to get some donated equipment in and really actually begin the Cyber Battle Lab with a couple older systems to be able to play around with, with uh, a couple of my interested friends. So during the time, we it was basically just an open floor with the exception of the donated equipment, it was completely blank other than chairs and desks and very few systems. But sooner we sooner than we expected, we started getting uh, funding from um, first the 
state of Maryland and, and BRAC, we were able to really procure our, our first systems and actually really get the, the ball rolling for, for our cyber lab. Um, afterwards, we started looking into getting more or less the network infrastructure down to really deploy what would be a secure and efficient way to get the cyber lab running. Um, we were since then able to actually transform the, the lab and actually make this a reality to the point where we could implement both a safe and unsafe side of the network and through research we're able to introduce more than just information uh, security and information assurance to kind of bleed into other our other degree programs such as computer uh, computer science um, astronomical engineering um, even electronic engineering um, cyber battle lab has provided myself and I know a lot of others with a wealth of information um, not just skill sets but just the raw research and development that you're generally not going to find in a classroom. A prime example being, for, for me at least, I've been able to do a lot more um, research and development and vulnerability um, assessments, being able to strictly go and dig into an operating system, figure out vulnerabilities with given tools. Um, I think I've gained uh, an enormously large skill set just based on the lab, and I know that there's quite a few other students that have as well. But from my experience, the lab in one single room has really introduced me to things like malware analysis, um, blade architecture and design, cloud computing, virtualization, you know, all of that just in, in one single area. Over time, it's the, the consistent research starts to boil in and really makes, a, really makes it become common knowledge, which is definitely, for me, improving what I want to learn and actually helps me dig a little bit farther into my research. But because of that, I want to thank primarily all of the support we've gotten from not only sponsors, but again, Pro uh, Professor Andrew Mary for actually getting the ball rolling for us. Um, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, again, the state of Maryland, and mainly just the staff that the adjunct professors, the faculty that give us the push to continue to actually give us new ideas and new concepts to look into. And overall, just everyone who's had interest in the lab. And because of that, I'm looking forward to see the, uh, the lab flourish, um, especially in the next coming years and after I graduate. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Mark Frickbaum and I'm currently seeking dual degrees in management of information technology and information assurance with a junior standing currently. I'm excited to share with you some information, some background information on my involvement with the Cyber Battle Lab. Having research programs nationwide before selecting Capital College, I was impressed with the expertise, skills, and internship opportunities available to me. One particular that piqued my interest initially was the formerly known computer lab, which Jeremy spoke of, which later was now transformed into the Cyber Battle Lab with school, community, and business support. Originally crafted by a student, Bill Littleton, who is currently an employee of Spaywar as a senior design project, the Cyber Lab has gone, undergone many improvements. Since its inception, this facility under the auspices of Dean Helen Barker has emerged as the regional entity for integrating majors and careers within the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Students have unique opportunities to attend cutting-edge workshops and to participate in hands-on exercises that highlight theoretical and applied use of technology to the business and STEM fields. I personally plan to pursue a leadership role in cybersecurity systems and networking field within the government or industry, continuing my education to the Presidential Management Fellows Program. My recent past internships in Russia with an oil development company and the Baltimore County government attest to the value and experience gained as a student extensively involved in Capital CBL program as a lab manager. Outside of providing an outstanding opportunity for Capital College students to develop skills and leadership in the field, the, cap the CBL has become a major magnet for career awareness outreach to promising middle and high school students. This effort has reinforced within current and future students the enormous opportunities and challenges that await them in the nation's growing cyber infrastructure. The continued support and partnerships from Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, the state of Maryland, NSA, and others via philanthropy, leadership, and volunteer support have enabled us to improve and expand the school's offering 
which translated into a robust program with stellar results and impact, and such. My fellow students are met with outstanding. Um, uh, my fellow students are met with outstanding internship experiences, job opportunities as a direct result of the input and our relationship with our sponsors and supporters. These collective efforts have improved the quality of life for the students, the faculty, the school, and nearby communities. With much appreciation, we applaud your efforts and are indebted for your vision, support, and encouragement. Thank you. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Austin Merson. I am a junior here at Capitol College in the Information Assurance Program, and I'm one of the more non-traditional students here. I actually didn't come to Capitol College until about eight and a half years into my career in the automotive industry, and uh, once the industry started falling off, I was looking for a new career, and cybersecurity caught my interest. I actually found out about Capitol from my mother, who works at the NSA, and they have an extensive program over there who seem to know about capital. And even though I've lived here my entire 26 years and have been down the street from here multiple times, I didn't know about it until about the last nine months. Uh, I've been here for just about a year now. And as soon as I got here, I heard that they had a cyber battle lab. And coming from the automotive industry back to a classroom, I knew it was gonna be a really tough transition for me, being as all of my knowledge from since I graduated high school till now had been hands-on practical application. I was in the field, I was doing it every day in and out for six, seven days a week. So I knew it was gonna be a tough transition for me and I heard about the Cyber Battle Lab and I could go up there and get a practical application to what I was gonna be learning in the classroom. I didn't stop the first day I got on campus. I walked straight to the dean's offices, said, where do I find the people in the Cyber Battle Lab? That's where I need to be. There's no way I'm gonna be passing the classes in, this, in the classroom without some kind of visual hands-on, gotta get my hands dirty and do it. Um, so they pointed me to Mark and Jeremy's dorm. Nobody seemed to know where they were. I finally <laughs> found out they were in G2. I marched right up to their dorm. I said, hey, I'm Austin. I need to be involved with the Cyber Battle Lab. I need this. Uh, I probably wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for the Cyber Battle Lab. Uh, it's a key foundation to my education here. Like I said, there's no way I would have made it through the classes without being able to practice what I learned in class in the Cyber Battle Lab. Uh, I'm the newest member of the group. Like I said, I've only been here for about nine months, but it's been a wonderful experience. I mean, it's just helped me grow. Uh, I had a little bit of base in computers. Like I said, my mother's worked on computers for a very long time. A lot of my friends have worked on computers, but I was into cars. Uh, didn't realize the kind of choices I was making. What can I say? Uh, had a lot of fun doing it though. Uh, but it's been a great experience here. And like I said, I couldn't have done it without the Cyber Battle Lab. And it's just like I said, there's just no replacement in my opinion for practical application. I mean, some people can learn well from books. That's just not me. Um, we would also like to thank a lot of the students who are here today attending in the audience who have helped keep our drive going, helped keep us getting up early in the morning when we may not want to, to open those doors, to help people learn. Um, first, I'd like to thank Eddie, who has been an instrumental part of helping us get the infrastructure down uh, recently. He's been staying late with us. You know, he's not a manager. He doesn't work in the Cyber Battle Lab. He's just been coming up and helping us. Um, we also have a few other students who have participated in competitions with us, like CCDC. Uh, in the back, we have Bria Sandoval and Reza Najibadi. Um, we've also got Irma, who is the newest addition to our Cyber Lab staff. She's helping us bridge the gap between the Cyber Lab and the SOI to bridge that space operations. You know, they're going to need some cybersecurity too all the electronics and everything in the space shuttles once people start to figure it out you know there's no telling what they could do to a space shuttle uh, we also have amanda in the back amanda rose another soi person who likes to come in and play with the lab books she actually was one of the first people who helped me figure out my labs were set up wrong she came in one day and was like i can't connect anything so uh also we've got some uh We've got David Ravulo back there. He's led a, a lot of our tours for us. He's brought a lot of students up into the Cyber Battle Lab, oh, like I said, on tours and everything else. Uh, and then we've got some newcomers, uh, like Electra Sher Sherlock and Frank Colbertson, who are 
going to be the future and hopefully keep it running. Uh, Electra is an, uh, another astronautical engineer who just was like, this is really interesting. She just started coming up and doing the labs. And now that we've got the infrastructure down, uh, hopefully we can help her learn a lot more. And Frank, I just met him a couple days ago at the golf tournament. And he's already been in the lab probably a handful of times. Helped make some Cat6 cables when we were struggling to push through and make these last couple cables. Uh, we'd also like to thank the IT staff for their continued support and help and instruction through this whole process to get this infrastructure secured. Uh, Michael Augustin, Sheldon, uh, Professor Exner, Ben, all you guys have been a great help in getting us through this process. And uh, we hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you, folks. As you probably suspect, college students have extracurricular interests. I want you to know that these gentlemen are multi-talented. Uh, among them, at least uh, two of the more senior members of the staff are accomplished movie producers and performers. So if you want to uh, see what they're up to in their free time, go to YouTube and click on Engineers on Winter Break and Engineers on Summer Break. <laughs> Quite a delightful little series of videos. <laughs> As they mentioned, we couldn't do this without our benefactors. And we do want to take a moment to uh, formally thank some of you who are with us today. Uh, Asuntha, if you could come forward again, please. And Mr. Murray, Gareth Murray from the Maryland Higher Education Commission, could you come forward, please? How are you guys doing today? Yeah. This is in grateful appreciation to the state of Maryland for sustaining support to the Cyber Battle Lab presented on behalf of the students of the faculty and staff here at Capitol College. Thank, Thank you very you much. Very much. much. Thank you. Got it? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks again so much. Appreciate you being here. Mr. Murray, yeah. pleasure meeting you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. As I mentioned earlier, Lockheed Martin has been instrumental to the inception, development, and early stages of our cyber battle lab activities, as well as broader cyber education initiatives throughout the college. Uh, we have with us today Mr. Hayden Land and Julie, and I think Mike Nance is here. Uh, whomever would like to come up and join me to uh, acknowledge and receive our thanks for your participation. In 2010, or 2010, they contributed some financial support to help us get started with uh, not only laboratory development, but public outreach and education activities to the community colleges and the high schools. And then as I mentioned, uh, last year, or earlier this year, Hayden and Mike and their colleagues put together a very nice white paper of battle lab scenarios for us. So they're contributing not only those wonderful checks we like to receive, but really good intellectual expertise to help grow the curriculum of the college. So Hayden, Mike, others from Lockheed Martin, thank you very much. Jeremy? Jeremy can read it. <laughs> you don't want to read your own award, do you? <laughs> we'll have our pro do it. In, uh, in grateful appreciation to Lockheed Martin for outstanding and sustained support of time, talent, and treasures, to the Capitol College Cyber Battle Lab, presented on behalf of the students, faculty, and staff. Thank you, all. Thank you all. Pleasure. Hayden. Oh, of course, of course. All right, you ought to know better to put me up here and not say something. So, uh, all right, um, I just want to thank Capitol for uh, partnering with us and our peers and, and industry for what they do. I'm a strong believer, uh, as many in this room, that creativity excels when you see the world through the eyes of others. And that's one thing that Capital has figured out. If you, if you look at their faculty, their balance of adjunct professionals, and their outreach to both industry and academia and government, they see the world through the eyes of the others, and they bring reality to this program. And that's a key element of why Lockheed is attached to this institution they have figured it out. Now we need to scale that more and more. 
uh, over the years, and, and, and I will just uh, only talk a minute or two, but I was on a 9-11 panel uh, about a month ago on the 10th anniversary of the 9-11. It was a very emotional panel. It was, uh, it was myself, David Bowen, the CIO of the FAA. It was A.T. Smith from uh, Secret Service. Robert Rodriguez, the uh, chairman of Sinet. Don Merowix, uh, a key figure in the intelligence agency. Um, and, and we reflected about that event. Um, the audience was 150 of the global CIOs across this, uh, this wonderful uh, world we live in. And, and I mentioned capital during some of my statements. And I talked about some of the secret sauce that we have here and how we need to take that sauce across other institutions uh, across this nation. So, uh, so I want you to know I'm talking about this institution in, in, in some pretty important venues. Um, last point I want to make, um, uh, no one cares if you do the wrong things right, uh, to be frank. Uh, here we're doing the right things. And, and, and by golly, they're being done the right way. So, so please keep it up. We will continue to partner uh, with, with the program here. Uh, I'm going to push them harder, uh, if, if you don't mind, Dr. Wood. Okay. And, and thanks again. Uh, there's nothing more important to me uh, in all the awards that our co corporation has received, myself uh, and others, when you get something from students, you know, I mean, it really, really means a lot. Uh, this is why we exist. This is why what we do in our corporation. Um, and they're our future. So I'm going to thank personally each of you and all of you uh, in the back of the room. Um, you are our future. So, uh, so learn, learn, learn. And when I'm old, I want to be protected too. Uh, the statement. <laughs> I'm getting pretty close to it. So, uh, so thank you very much and uh, carry on. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Very recently, another major contributor to uh, cybersecurity and uh, STEM careers and professions in our region came to the, the fore and helped us uh, develop new resources and technologies for the Cyber Battle Lab. Michael Castor from Northrop Grumman, would you like to come up? Thank you very much. All right, this is presented to, well, let's switch them now. <laughs> there we go. Let's get the right one. All right, in grateful appreciation to Northrop Grumman for financial support to the Capital College Cyber Lab, presented on behalf of the students, faculty, and staff on this day, October 13th, 2011. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you once again to our, first of all, to our students, our faculty and staff, our uh, corporate partners, and also our, our uh, Cyber Battle Lab benefactors. Uh, just to let you know, uh, Dr. Wood and I mentioned a little bit about Cybersecurity Month. We have a full list of events. There should be some brochures in the back. If not, you can see one of the staff and, and we can give you uh, some details about uh, each of the events. We're going to go upstairs for a demo in the Cyber Battle Lab. One last time, I want to give our students a, a big round of applause. Yeah. All right, so, so I think so that we don't have a, a, a mass exodus here, maybe what we'll do is if, if you guys, so you have you guys ready to go up, upstairs? You want to just form a line and go right up? Maybe we can, we have an elevator here that we can use. We have a stairs over there and uh, stairs all the way down at the end of the hallway. So we'll try to equally go in different directions so we can all get up there. It's going to be tight in the battle lab, so please come in, don't be shy. Sit down at the workstations and uh, we'll, we'll get rolling in just a few minutes. Um, so quick tour of the room, um, this is our lab manager office, which is 24 ones. Um, so we'll kind of have an overview and watch the students and uh, help them out whenever they need help. And then over here is our actually um, our new business center. Um, this is called the uh, BRC Business Resource Center. And because information insurance is so intertwined with business principles, we try to get every student in here, not only business and uh, ITIA, but engineering as well. So this business center right here is catering to those students who are not IA per se, and want to get an extra step and an extra kind of learning curve into the IA industry. So we have lab books for them to use, which is actually written by one of our professors. Uh, it's on our bookshelf right there. Um, we even get them involved with forensic school to do all the uh, software right there. So we want to get everyone basically involved um, in IA because every field, like I said, involves some sort of cybersecurity aspect. 
one, one of the uses of the BRC is, and we're ready to set one up, is it's where the dedicated systems will be for our students who are doing uh, internships with companies like yours. They'll have a dedicated system to work on that will be locked down uh, in, this, in this room for them to do internship work that can be done on campus. So this is uh, currently actually under construction, under renovation, we'll say. We're getting in some new systems, as Dean Harper stated. Um, so we're getting that going. We expect to have that up and running in the next, uh, within the next couple weeks to a month or so. Um, so that's through right there. And out here, we have the systems throughout all the side, including the uh, five in the middle that are all interconnected to two networks, like I said. The green network, which is uh, going through our systems, that's the capital servers, so students can use the internet for R&D research and whatnot. And the red network, which is our lockdown network, where students want to start exploring malware analysis and whatnot, um, applying Trojans over the network. We want to keep that contained. We don't want that to decide to spread over the capital network, not permit that happen. So we keep everything contained here so students have that experience. We have um, a variety of virtual machines on all the computers in here, different flavors of uh, Linux, Windows, uh, and whatnot on the computer, so students can get a taste of whatever they really want to learn on. Um, we try to get every student who comes in as a non we'll say techie to learn Linux. It's a great skill. We are finding that a lot of even business students are taking to the <coughs> Linux uh, environment and um, are really expanding their horizons in that area. And that, of course, turns into getting them at our, uh, our competition teams. Um, as uh, you heard in the, uh, in the uh, auditorium over there, the uh, space, that we are sending a team to MDC3. I believe that's actually in a week or so, so we are preparing for that. As we do, going to be after you guys leave, we'll be hedging the computers and uh, working on our pivoting skills and not very popular. So that's um, the aspect there. And then we have the Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition, which we're already forming a team for and getting ready for that, which will be in the more or less March time. So we do a lot of uh, different kind of items here in the lab. We try to, um, as Jeremy stated, involve every student. I started out actually as an MIT major, um, Management and Information Technology, which is more or less um, management mixed with business, uh, mixed with IA and IT. So it's a wide, it's a wide range of different uh, information. And once I came up to the lab and started working in here, I took my first IA class. I just fell in love with it. So I thought, well, I want to keep the management. I'm going to stick with that, but I need to add IA with it. So without further ado, I guess we're ready, Jeremy. So we have a quick demo for you guys displaying our new uh, virtual uh, environment, and uh, we'll get that going for you. So when we first established the lab, we didn't want to completely destroy the computer, so we had licensing for VMware, and so instead of destroying computers, we would destroy the apps. So what we want to do now is kind of migrate away from having to be here physically all the time, or what happens if we have someone from California, they can't really make use of the lab given their distance, or given whatever reason they may have. So we've been looking into ways of assisting that and ways of getting our lab online for people who don't have the, public, the privilege of being here to still be able to benefit. So we've looked into um, what's called, it's, again, another one of VMware's products. It's uh, vSphere, basically an online service of the VMware workstations that you find on your computers. So in essence, what we are able to do is create entire virtual networks or just even clusters of virtual machines that are um, hardly any resource usage to the person that's actually running the virtual machine and on their computers. So what I kind of wanted to demonstrate today is what that process is, um, how it can benefit um, our institution as both for the student body but also for um, industry, business, government as well. So on this one I'm going to demonstrate, I've set up vSphere to have two malware analysis environments and I kind of wanted to show how I have them separated so you could actually have two teams working simultaneously or more if you could actually configure that. And But at the same time you're not limited to having one person per VM, you can have multiple people working at the same virtual machine we can have multiple teams working on the same piece of malware. We can have multiple teams working on multiple pieces of malware. So you're, you're extremely flexible in what you want to do. But for this specific demonstration, 
Realm. I just created a general lab user, so we're going to log in as lab number two. And I'll also show you an administrator's um, account just so you can kind of see the entire breakdown of the work machines. So here is our analysis environment two, which is three, four, currently have three running virtual machines and a fourth one that's not active, activated right now. So if anyone is logged in as lab number two, um, we've logged in various accounts on each of the uh, computers. So if it has icons, you can click inventory and it'll give you this drop down over here on your left. You'll be able to actually follow along if you want. Um, and I'll bring up on this side the administrative view. So you can see that there's actually two different teams. But based on permission settings, you can actually deny team one from seeing what team two has. And that means so if you're working on some sort of network type attack, team one's network is not going to interfere with team number two's network. So that will basically break out any interference that you may have, which would actually allow multiple teams to work on multiple pieces of malware. So if you want to actually view the virtual machine, you can click it. There's a console tab over here, or you can right click it and open console. And this will actually allow you to let me get it on. There's already two people that are viewing this. So this is our, our backtrack. And I am logging into it. If anyone wants it to, someone could press enter that's actually viewing this, it will actually launch the GUI. So that will prove that, again, you can work more as a team, but again, you can still have over here in lab two. I'll bring up this view as well. There's lab number two, you can see the differences between them, so you can have multiple people being on multiple teams. So I'll go ahead and start it up. When did you just start it? Um, if anyone's looking at the top, it'll say lab one. So if anyone actually has lab one, you can go ahead and press enter. I can go to steal control from lab two. So this will actually bring up the more preferred version of an operating system, which is the user interface. So if you're not quite techy with command line, you're still able to have, for example, one team might prefer command line, the other team might prefer an actual user interface. So you're basically allowed to have as much flexibility as you want. And also the benefit of vSphere is the user integration. You can easily activate um, user controls via Active Directory or um, Server 2003 or 2008. Any users that you specifically create on those server operating systems can carry over to this. So if you have an entire corporation's worth of users, it's not hard to actually integrate them with that as soon as you basically click an install button and the integration is there. So you're basically guaranteed any user access that's already pre-built. Once you configure vSphere to work with that, those settings all carry over. You don't have to actually reconfigure your entire corporation just to be able to access work machines securely. Um, the other thing is what I specifically set up was how to prevent a specific group from not seeing another one. Um, as far as the virtual machines go, you can allow specific users to access specific virtual machines, or you can access specific groups and allow that entire group to access that virtual machine. So you're guaranteed to have either fine grain access, 
so per user. Or for simplicity, you could have an entire users group, for example, lab users or students or administrators. And those can have an entire rule set instead of going for each person, depending on what size of the size of um, industry you have. But just to kind of more or less prove resource wise, um, we'll go ahead and start up both of these. Since I have moved them to the correct screen. So we can start. student one, student two, and it'll also show the instructor as assisting that student so they have the assurance that they're being either watched so if they do make a mistake they can be corrected or if they have any questions they can easily be answered. two separate switches and then assign each lab to that specific switch which will then guarantee that the traffic doesn't carry over to, from one network to another. Um, also, kind of one, one last thing and one neat little trick you can do is if anyone has actually used um, operating systems similar to PFSense or has ever set up more or less like a router with Linux, you can actually set up a virtual machine as a router and then be able to convert traffic from one network to another. So you're actually able to have full virtualized networks with three to four actual operating systems and all of it is being run within one centralized location. And that's pretty much the, uh, the overview of what vSphere has to offer. And Again, the goal is to be able to fully get this online to the point where distance learning students can actually have the very same amount of benefit as being in the actual lab. For some of that, some that may have missed it about the, the local setup and the red and green network and the uh, competitions and the so that'll, that'll bleed into what, uh, what Eddie has to showcase. But uh, first, we, we wanted to subdivide the networks in the lab. So if we had someone that was actually doing homework and we had someone that wanted to do a penetration testing lab, we didn't have someone attacking the person that was doing homework, it'd be bad. So we more or less developed the easiest way of going about this was completely separating the networks, completely cutting off the red network from Capital College. And what we've done is all of the um, wall plates that are under each desk, um, they're separated into red and green. The red is just a local switched and routed network. And what I set up was an interface inside the router. So if you are able to go to that interface, then you've broken into the router. But however, the interface doesn't actually go to Capital College, so you can still do a proof of concept. But for the green network, that's strictly research and development. And that's more for if you have to do homework, if you want to do labs that require online access, um, Blackboard, which we, which we use here for a lot of quizzing and testing. Um, you're able to do that without having to worry about someone getting rid of all your progress. And I guess uh, Austin, if you want to 
more explain what might happen if something did go wrong in the green network? All right. Uh, basically, uh, our plan, it's not quite implemented right now. Uh, we just actually finished with all the network infrastructure. Uh, I know most of our fingers are bleeding. We've been running so much Cat6 lately. Um, but what we're, our plan is, is we're going to have access control list. When you log into a computer, you have a login that tells you whether or not you're on the red or the green network. If you're on the red, you're completely, like you said, cut off from the internet. We have no outbound connection from our red network. That's from a patch panel here to our switch there. That goes to a patch panel in our closet. That goes to the wall plates, and that's it. Uh, our green network actually has our drop from IT to the internet. And that, again, goes from our patch panel here through our router, but out to the internet. Now, if we catch anybody doing anything bad, like uh, Vice President McConaughey over here, we know he's doing some malicious code. <laughs> we decided we would need an emergency protocol. So we have implemented our kill, pseudo kill-9 protocol, which Eddie is going to demonstrate for us right now. Eddie, if you would. Eddie actually designed this system. So if you all noticed, first so. you all had access to the virtual machines. And you noticed there was a green light right. over there on the wall. He hit the button. Now we have a red light. So, Mr. McConaughey, would you like to try and access your VMs Absolutely. which you're launching, uh, which you're launching all this malicious code from, and trying to destroy someone's project over there? No Irish jokes. <laughs> Very short. There you So, what we've effectively done is we put a switch from that button and those lights into our internet drop. We patched it from the patch panel to IT switch in there for our internet drop. And if we hit that button, there is no internet to this room whatsoever. So if there was to be an emergency situation where someone may have somehow found a way to bridge the gap between the red and the green network, we'll have our IDS or whatever that we're going to configure set up to monitor our internet drop. As soon as we see something go across, we can hit that button and it's completely cut off. Now we can isolate the incident and prevent anything from getting out to the internet. This is the result of having a meeting with these guys a couple weeks ago and me just saying, well, what if? That's all. So yeah, I, I patched it in. Uh, I patched it into our port from our internet drop. I patched it into the switch. So as long as that green light's on, we have internet on the green network. As soon as we hit that button, all connections get dropped. Uh, we were actually, it was a very long night last night. Very long night. <laughs> Late into the night, we actually got talking and we just decided that we're possibly going to try and develop an Android app that the IGS, if none of us are actually here in the lab and there's something going on where something might actually be leaking out to the internet, some form of malicious code, it, the iPhone app or the Android app will alert our phones that there's malicious stuff going on on the green network and then we can remote access from the app and basically hit the button on our screen on the app and it'll change that from green to red. And this puts them, all the cyber this puts and them and into already. The, the whole wireless area, which and I, my colleagues are here, that is, that's going to be the biggest issue America's facing, is, is the wireless penetration issues. And they're already up on it. And we've got like two app classes going in computer science. So there's the integration. Between the and we've already uh, started playing with the Zigbee spectrum, so we're probably going to go based on sure. that. Right. So we have a lot of development going on here, a lot of students taking the uh, iPhone and um, Android development classes. So we've already started the initial processes of uh, just, you know, a joke that uh, the uh, McConaughey made to make it happen, and yeah. now we'll take it uh, one we, step We decided around. we really liked the idea, and we thought it would be fun. <laughs> it was just a question. And then, <laughs> then Eddie was like, I think I can make that circuit. <laughs> He comes over here with a box of boards and chips last night and he's like, oh, brings a soldering iron and he's sitting over there while we're cleaning and trying to reorganize all the wiring. And then I'm like, oh crap, I gotta wire two more Cat6 cables to give us internet connection to our little button and, you know, we're running around doing that and, uh, like I said, late into the night, we're like, hmm, for the CyberLab manager, we could develop an Android app that'll allow us to shut this off remotely. And just in case no one's here and there's something leaking out to the network. That's kind of our progression here. Yeah. So currently you have to be present to hit the switch. Currently. Currently. Um, yeah. This is just beta testing. We're yes. calling it kill-9, pseudo-kill-9 
protocol beta. And if anybody knows what pseudo kill dash nine is, that's a Linux command for force quit anything. So that's our protocol for shutting off the internet. I'm guessing at some point you would also automate the process completely where if the idea is detected, something we can I'm, I'm guessing you're going to go that route. I, we could. We haven't. We haven't fully. Like I said, uh, Eddie literally came over last night and uh, wired up the circuit. So we really just have the circuit. We just got it working for today to make sure we could demonstrate kind of where we're going with the future of the cyber lab, what we kind of want to leave behind in our stead. Um, like I said, I'm a junior. Mark's a junior. Jeremy's a junior. Uh, we're all starting to get internships. We're starting to get out in the field. Um, this is just some of the ideas that we're posing to leave behind for some of the younger students. Uh, I know one of the main things that we really want to implement is an access control list for the red and green network. That way when you log on to the computer, it automatically knows to disable one adapter or the other. Uh, that way we won't have any leaks between the two networks. That way you can't bridge the NICs, you can't do any of that. Um, and then like I said, we're going to have you know, different firewalls and our routers and stuff set up just to do some proof of concept stuff. Uh, the ESX server, I know Jeremy's working with IT on that downstairs to get a really broad range uh, ESX setup going on. So that way, graduate students, uh, businesses, anybody who wants to take advantage of our lot can. This and was uh, like a fun visual thing to make it clear, you know. Yeah, this doing is, the malware analysis, we're off of the network. We're not yeah, going to mess right. up college <laughs> experience. And so the brain were good. So. There's something nobody else knew about. We figured we could surprise everybody. Nobody but us four knew about it. We were like, we're going to push a button and turn everything off. Right? <laughs> Um, actually, I have one more question. So, um, at this point, if somebody, let's say somebody wants to back on I'm guessing to switch back and forth from the red network to the green network, you would, um, I think he suggested that you would actually plug in the cable to the appropriate point. Uh, we could do that too. Um, oh, do you have another, or have you already implemented we, that? It, we've been just bouncing ideas around okay. left and right. I mean, the way uh, myself and Jeremy, we did most of the network uh, set up throughout the past several weeks as far as patching the cables and everything. So what we've done out here is we literally have our patch panel 1 to 15 for the stations around the perimeter. Um, the stations in the middle, actually, since they can go right to the switch, we just have them right to the switch and we can always just unplug them from there. We know exactly which stations those are. But as far as the stations around the perimeter, it's literally station 1 from here all the way around to 15 with the exception of our media computer because that's going to be only controlled by lab managers and administrators here in the lab. Um, but we have it, late. I, we set it up and we turned it out so that it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, all the way around just like you see the stations here. So if anybody wants to get on a station, that is one of the ways that we can prevent anything from happening. We can very easily just unplug station 1 from our patch panel, lock our cabinet back, nobody can plug it in. They would not have access to the brain network. So that's one other way we can disable it. Uh, it's just a bunch of ideas bouncing around right now. Uh, now that we've got the infrastructure set up and all that craziness is kind of over with for the moment, since everything's tested and working, thank God, uh, <laughs> we can now sit down and kind of thoroughly go through and plan exactly what controls we want to implement. You know, everything in information assurance, you got to plan, you know, like he's an MIT major, uh, business major, you got to be able to implement ideas for the business world too. So it's a matter of balancing productivity, cost, and security. And so that's kind of what we're going to sit down now and do and decide, all right, these controls might be a little bit excessive. It's not going to be very productive. We're having trouble for people getting in to access ESX, or we're having trouble getting ESX out. So maybe we want to forget about this control. Maybe we try this one here. So that's kind of where we're at at this stage. That's kind of some of the stuff that we're going to leave behind, just like the button. You know, maybe we might have an Android app that if the manager on duty has to step out for a minute and then all of a sudden, or maybe we do it completely automated. We've got a couple of good CS managers. I see one sitting over here, Mr. Tuan Fo. And uh, we've got Carter. I don't know where Carter went at the moment. He was here earlier. Two genius programmers. Maybe they'll write a script for us one day and it'll automate itself. And then we won't even have to do anything. And then we can have the Android app as a backup. We've got a button on the wall. So just <laughs> lots of things we can do from here on out now that we have our own. <coughs> You know, network infrastructure. We've got our networks. There's just so many ideas that we have. It's yep. just a matter of what are we going to implement? How is it going to benefit us? For how is it going to slow us down? Are we going to need more manpower to do this? Are we going to need so more equipment? And just going to weigh the options and see what we need to implement. 
and implement it the best way that we can to best serve the students here at Capital and businesses, whoever wants to come in and do things. Um, we are talking about mentoring some teams uh, for Cyber Patriots and high school team. Patterson has expressed some interest in coming here for us to mentor them. You know, how is it going to be easy for them? Can we have them remote in? Do we, do we have to have them come here for right now? Just a bunch of different ideas, like you said. Now that we've got this in place, the ideas are just kind of endless for us right now, and we're trying to sort out our heads. Maybe take a day off. Maybe. <laughs> and because we literally built the network. I haven't slept in over like 30 hours at this point, so <laughs> we're all kind of just like, it's done. It works. Next step. <laughs> and because we literally, we literally pretty much run this lab, it is a basically a student-driven lab. We have our uh, manager of use to upper management that we have to fulfill, but essentially we run this lab, um, aside from breaking into walls and whatnot. And that, <laughs> Kind of. um, but we essentially run this lab, so with the infrastructure we have right now, literally the sky's the limit. Yeah. So we, we just took this idea ourselves, and for about a week and a half, two weeks, we were in here long nights, long days, yeah. just putting in all effort to get this cable run, giving business proposals to the school, doing the cost of research and whatnot, to get the equipment in, getting it on time, and then just going based on what we learned in classes and other skills, to get everything wired and attaching cables to the ceiling. Um, what is the experience for the remote user? Basically, the experience for the remote user is essentially it, it mimic the in, uh, in uh, house environment. So, with the power that we have in the relay center downstairs, um, the servers and whatnot, basically, instead of coming to the lab, any lab that you need to do for a class, let's say you're doing a class of capital or CH training, you'd be able to remote into our vCenter service and do all your labs going on in a virtualized environment from wherever you are in the world at a, basically a speed where it'll assume that you're basically at your desk with no lag. What are the the details of that interaction? Is it web based? Is there a virtual yeah. desktop? It, it's all web based. It's all web -based. You're, you're connected live to the server that's hosted here. All the VMs are hosted here, and it literally streams everything to your computer. Uh, are they able to install software? Um, it, it all depends on what the um, the actual operating system specs are. The vSphere um, client installs its own software, right. and it just goes to which a vSphere. Right now, we're using vSphere. Uh, it seems to be the best platform. It seems that everybody has like, the most functionality with it, um, just based on the different things that we can do with it. We've already had workstations for a long time. We've already worked with it a little bit. It, it's basically going to be an environment where not only us, but teachers, can create labs for their students, post them on the, on the vSphere, give the students their instructions. Here are your virtual machines. Here are your labs. Here's your username and password. I need you to log in and do these labs. It is kind of all web-based, all the servers are, all the VMs are hosted here. But our, our goal is that you, when you log into our servers, the experience you get, even though it's web-based and streaming, we're gonna have enough power to be able to support the users so that it feels like you're actually there using a, a VM locally rather than you get the lag time and slow you down. Back to your also, original question. We're um, in initial stages of the virtual environment. You're going to be at our advisory board. So you'll see a little bit more of what we're doing. Um, you're actually going to see demonstrated one of the Lockheed exercises. We, we were given a white paper from Lockheed Martin, which has scenarios based on attacks at the industry level. So we have about five or six labs that are going to be developed towards that. So one of our professors is going to demonstrate that a little later. And we'll get into more. Are any labs up and running now? If so, which ones? The, the one that you'll see is probe and... Um, we'll get into the, what we have following us is, as part of our BRAC grant from the state, we established a, the, the BRAC grant advisory board. And you know, reached out to colleagues and friends that from, from UMBC and Prince George's Community College, and, and as well as Lockheed Martin, and they're coming together. We, I guess we meet almost quarterly. Progress reports, here's what's going on, sharing information. So after all this, we'll get back to work and bring that group up to speed as well. The, the idea is we will create collaboratively these virtual labs that can be shared with the, with the Maryland schools all over the state at, at age grade appropriate levels so they can experience all the, the different aspects 
concerning you know with basic password construction all the way up to some of the nuances that you've seen here it, uh, and this will help again create a better cyber barrel we good so, anymore this is good any more questions or anybody you want to but well, any of the students were Why did you choose to never make a video as if isolating the lab? Um, well, if memory serves me correctly, I think we're going to try and do red and blue, but we had trouble with blue tables. Is that correct, Mark? You said you rather than just play uh, something. Yeah. Oh. Uh, because it's the easiest way. Um, not only is it the easiest way, but it's also about scalability. We want to be able to expand in the future. We don't want to limit ourselves to what we have now. So by segregating the networks like this, uh, if you look, we already have extra space on our patch panels now. Uh, we could probably add another eight computers in here if need be, and we have space where we can just run eight more cables, patch them down, plug them in, image them, because our image server's already set up there, and they're ready to go. In a, in a day, we could have probably eight more computers up, up and running in the lab. So that's kind of why we went this way. Um, it also provides scalability, not just from the equipment we have here, but we could also put other patch panels, other switches, and it would just be a real easy process for us to run some more cables up through our holes we already had in the ceiling to another switch, to another patch panel, and just grow the lab however big we need it, whatever we need it to do. Um, and so it doesn't slow us down for progression in the future. Well, we, we yeah. could still, still be able to do research in here and connect with the internet, so that's why we have the you, internet. Yeah. Right? You don't want to just come in here and be able to do one thing. If one student comes in here and they want to do all red network stuff, you don't want anybody else who wants to come up here and, and use the internet, do some research, do labs that way, not be able to do that as well. Cool, but could you just get a dedicated connection to the labs itself? Or? Then, you, see, here's, still this, is, this is the right. business aspect that comes in, too is you have to justify the cost. We already have a very large internet connection for the entire school. So can you, can we justify the need for our own internet connection here at the moment? Now in the future, like I said, as we grow the lab and everything, it may require that we're taking up so much bandwidth from the school, from the dorms, from the other buildings that we may need our own internet drop here. Um, we can't justify that need now. So this is the easiest way to make it scalable. Because now too, when we if we were to add our own internet drop, we've already got it set up. We can just add it right to the green network where the old internet drop is. We don't have to change the things. It's set up ready to go. You know, five minutes later. This is by far the most scalable, easiest, convenient, secure way. Color coded. <laughs> Color coded. We know how everything is. You know, it's not like we have to search for anything now. Uh, Whereas if you isolate it, you have to go back in the patch panel and you're looking for the wall of jet, and you're looking for this, you're looking for that. If we really have just a single isolated incident, I can walk right up to the kid. Oh, coming from computer two. Done. Problem solved, or we can hit our button, whatever the case may be. This is the easiest way to really prevent any kind of breaches. In fact, the matter is students need internet because we have the VMs on the computers. We let the students destroy them, literally. So if a student wants to download, you know, a new uh, Metasploit plugin or something like that from the internet, instead of running to, let's say, an internet kiosk where we have one computer dedicated drop only, or on the other computer we've isolated, it wouldn't be efficient for them running to one key machine with a flash drive, putting it to the other machine, and plus, you know, by pop on that flash drive from the Metasploit module and whatnot. Um, so it's just more, this is the most efficient, cost-effective, and effective, basically, network that we can offer here, basically to balance out the internet research and the basically development and, and um, vulnerability assessment. And, uh, and you're also talking about the, the monitoring too. I mean, if we had our own dedicated drop in there, we just always try to isolate ourselves. It adds an element, an extra element of monitoring that we have to do. Um, with this, like I said, we've got our firewalls configured. We know exactly what's going in and out on the green network. We know exactly what's going in and out on the red network. We know exactly where our red network is. We know exactly where our green network is. We don't have to worry about it. Once it's set, once our configuration is set, okay. over the time, as we expand, we may need to make those changes. But for right now, since it's set, we can just let it go. Students can come in here, just start doing whatever they want. All we have to do is hit a button, flip a switch, pull a cable, 
whatever the case may be. Um, it's going to be real efficient. Um, since there is sometimes only one of us up here at a time, if we had 15 students in here, um, what we were talking about with access control lists, the students log in, one manager can be here and manage that because the students can log into the different networks and the computers will take care of that, the switches will take care of it. They'll manage the connections, they'll send things where it needs to go. So that way we don't have to run around and just take care of 15 students logging in at one time. And this will greatly increase the speed of our process too. Any questions? Yeah, is this where the MDC Those four computers are the ones that we use to connect to the environment. Um, we, we, but we are going to be starting our CCDC training soon. MDC3 is basically just us in here um, working on different backtrack labs and just messing around and looking. We do an adjunct faculty that actually um, come out of the space and we push off on a few things that we may need extra help in. Um, that's more or less more for CCDC than MDC3. MDC3 is such a you know, upcoming um, brand new thing and they've changed, our, uh, they've changed the objective of the competition about three times now, which is different uh, formalities. So we've been coping with that and basically re re uh, re evaluating uh, the way that we're going to uh, look at the event and attack over there. Uh, but CCDC is primarily a defensive competition. And for that, we have mentoring sessions with adjunct faculty and faculty here. Um, we have partnerships uh, with uh, corporations around. Um, we have uh, some friends over at uh, that NASA's uh, Austin Orient uh, helps us out a little bit as well. So between all those, we uh, we try to coach everyone. We, we're only allowed, I believe, two or six or eight. 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 So but we fill, but we fill up the allowance, which I believe is ten or twelve, um, with other students, just so they can get the benefit of, uh, as well as alternates. We we fill them in. Uh, we try to get as many freshmen as we can just to get them running, um, you know, from the beginning. But we get them filled in, and so as long as we don't let's say we get we don't get sick and we have to make it to the event, they still gain that knowledge from actually attending yeah. all the mentoring sessions with us. And um, all the coaching as well. That was actually the first event that I ever did here. I actually started here in January when they were actually on their way to the regionals. I attended every day of CCDC. I couldn't even tell you how much information I picked up in those three days, just being around the people that are there and watching what they do and how they work. It is an absolutely crazy experience to just see how these people just go through these systems and all of a sudden. There it is, they're in, they're shutting down your system. Like, hmm. How'd they do that? And then, uh, of course, like I said, we got to go see your guys' cyber, cyber lab afterwards, and just the experiences there were just absolutely awesome. Especially for someone who was really just gaining an interest in cybersecurity, going there and getting to meet really the influential people in the field at Colossus and Dorian. I spent hours talking to him about Nessus and uh, Larry Kasky about the badges he created, you know, the Arduino badges. With they do transmission. Um, and there's just so much you can learn. So even if you can't actually compete as one of the eight members, if you can go and just be around those people, one of the, the big things that uh, I picked up since starting in cybersecurity, uh, after going to DEF CON, after doing some of these conferences, see, meeting a lot of people in the field, uh, I went to a talk uh, by Paul Asadorian, and one thing he said there is, it's a culture, it's about being surrounded by the culture, being immersed in it, and I that couldn't agree with them more. I mean, that's one of the biggest things, is just going to the event, coming in here, immersing yourself in the security culture, getting yourself in that frame, frame of mind, thinking that way, I think has been one of the biggest things that has helped me transition from what I used to do as a career to what I'm doing now. And I think it's made it an easy and fun experience. I'd encourage you guys, you all, you guests, to get to know these guys. I mean, their dedication is above and beyond. I mean, if, if I had a company now, I'd hire them regardless of what it was, but they do love IA, cybersecurity. Um, so as they mentioned, this this came to fruition within the last, well, the, the upgrade, the lab upgrade came to fruition within the last. We've been working on uh, yeah, it. So, I think we got our first parts in probably about three weeks ago. Yeah. And ever since then, it's been a nonstop trying to help students work on infrastructure, take classes. So that, take classes. I'm actually working for CNN right now. I, I've had an internship for them, so I still work for them almost full time, um, doing broadcast support, which is kind of fun. I get to be in the field. And then I get to come here and I get to play with things like 
out there, I get to see a little bit of things you probably won't see from anywhere else in the cybersecurity field. We don't, unfortunately, don't get to do as much cybersecurity as I'd like there. Um, but it's still a fun way to get out in the business world and see how you interact in the business world um, with cybersecurity. Um, but also, the nice thing about coming back in here now is, too, we'll be able to set up our own CCDC environment here now that we have our own network. We can set it up. We can VLAN our switch for the red network, have a red team, blue team, and set up our own attacker fence in there. It's really uh, make a mock CCDC environment. If we have people who come in and work with us, you know, a couple of professional pen testers, red team members from previous CCDCs that we've met, they can come in, they can be on here, and they can just go to town and tear us up and tell us how they did it, help us learn. And we don't have to worry about anything at the end of the day. We go to our little phone server, hit the reset button, we go to sleep overnight, come back in the morning, and everything's back to normal. Business as usual. So it's really been a great experience and a lot of fun actually getting this set up. Now that we've got it where we want it, we just have endless <coughs> ideas of what we can do with it. It's going to be a fun time here. And I love seeing that. Fre oh, there we have a ton of freshmen. Normally we saw more or less sophomores and juniors and seniors in here, but now we've had an influx of freshmen coming in here. Um, we really don't have a strong tech basis, and they are really, really soaring in here. And a lot of them have already uh, given them our, uh, our email addresses, and they're ready for whenever we can get the infrastructure up to do the red team, blue team. We were uh, joking earlier about painting the walls red and blue to uh, show that. It wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank, you all, about it. thank you all for coming. I know it's getting later in the morning. Uh, please feel free to buttonhole staff or, or the students as you wish. Uh, it's just a great day. It's all part of our cybersecurity month here at Capitol. Thank you all very much. And you can see what a little bit of investment and a lot of of energy can, can result in. And so again, we thank those that, that helped us, and not just with the money, time, talent, and treasure. Thank you very much.